Hi. Ooh, look at your background. <laughs> and we are broadcasting in five, four, three, two, and it's going on speaker view. Hello. Yay. Hello, everyone. Welcome Hello. to four, four. Uh, I'm hot, so that's where we are right now. You know. are hot. Yes. Not. <laughs> I don't think I can be seen right now. Let's see. There we go. Somebody. Hello. 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 Uh, welcome to the latest edition of 4-4. 4-4 Power and Patterns. Yes. Good afternoon. Thank you to everyone who is here, who's joining us this afternoon. Um, I'm so, so appreciative of the continued support. Um, this is the fourth one so very exciting um this afternoon we have vanessa l german alicia pillar and omalara williams McAllister joining us each of them have this incredibly varied uh multimedia practice a lot of them leaning towards sculpture and adornment um, and we'll talk a little bit about that i do want to um reiterate why i started 4-4 i think a really important thing here in this moment in this um, slow down, this lock-in. We've been seeing so many voices highlighted, but I felt like I wasn't seeing Black women's voices highlighted. So I really wanted to do that, and I really wanted to share their visions, not through my own lens, but through theirs. So um, that's critical. And um, something that I also wanted to say, I was looking at a video that um, Taja Lindley posted of her work mm -hmm her ongoing performance series that highlights exactly what we are protesting in the streets about, taking to the streets all over the country about. Um, and I just want to read that for you all. Understand this work we do is not about clout. It's not about gaining individual visibility. It's about making these stories, the brilliance born from our simply still being here, continuing the legacy of distilling depth and crystallizing beauty from devastation. This is and has always been about transmutation. Broadening a path forward for the future for ourselves, for our ancestors, because no one ever really dies and one day you will be an ancestor too. So that said, I also want to um, pull a little something out um, mm -hmm. to get us started. Um, if you have something at home to do so, I encourage you to do that. Also, again, take screenshots make recordings, tag us all. I'll put everyone's um, handles and websites as appropriate in the chat. Um, again, thank you for being here. Am I not on mute? <laughs> <laughs> you are not. As a also let us honor that we are on indigenous land. That's another important thing here um, that I'm sure will come up through the course of this conversation today. Um, I thank my ancestors for allowing me to be here to do this work, for allowing us to be here to do this work, to witness this moment, to witness this continuation of long standing struggle for freedom not just in this country, but in this world, on this plane. I ask them to open a path for us to talk about some really important stuff today. And with that, I introduce Vanessa German. Vanessa German is a visual and performance artist based in Pittsburgh neighborhood of Homewood. Homewood is the community that is a driving force behind German's powerful performance work and whose cast off relics from the language of her copiously embellished sculptures. As a citizen artist, German explores the power of art and love as a transformative force in the dynamic cultural system of communities and neighborhoods. She is the founder of Love Front Porch and The Art House, a community arts initiative for the children of Homewood, 
Her work is in private and public collections, including Everson Museum of Art, Feige Art Museum, Flint Museum, I'm sorry, Flint Institute of Arts, Spelman College Museum of Fine Art, Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art, David C. Driscoll Center, also rest in peace to David C. Driscoll, um, the Wadsworth Athenaeum Museum of Art, etc. I'm so, 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 so excited for Vanessa to be here. Um, and I will let you take it away. Uh, I, I would really like it if you would um, actually start me with a question. Like, what inspired you um, to have me here? That's a good launching place for me. <laughs> Naya. <laughs> Is that too much? No, I thought you'd never ask. No, um, <laughs> I love you so much. <laughs> so, ooh. um, I guess I'll do this for each of you now since we've started the president here. Um, yes, if you know me well, you know that I always have a fan in the warm. <laughs> so here it is, virtually. Um, okay, so. The first time I saw your work in person, I thought, oh my God, <laughs> this is it. This is the thing that I've been looking for. Um, just in terms of thinking about, you know what, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm actually going to find this post that I wrote. I went to see, so the first time I saw your show um, was at Pavel's, um, or a show of yours was at Pavel Zubik. This is like four years ago now, almost uh -huh. four full years. Um, and you just had all of these incredible, it was an, pardon? It was the army. Yes, yeah. exactly, exactly. Um, I'm almost there. Hold a second, I wish I could, um, share these images with you i can like post a link to to my uh instagram in the chat so that everyone can see the images that i'm talking about here we go so here is what i wrote about this the thing i love most about vanessa german's work is that it is so clearly for black girls particularly those who might be made to feel as though they have nothing. It is a reminder that we are infinitely creative and ourselves an encompassment of all things. She creates her power figures through found objects and assemblage. You see all kinds of things bound up in her sculptures, antique ceramic figurines, retro hair dryers, lace, strings of cowrie shell bracelets, and so much more. Everything is bound together onto the bodies of what is best described as saint-like figures. Ultimately, these works are beatitudes, carrying the blessings of black futures and pasts. Every one of these sculptures is a long, loud, ecstatic prayer to and through all our ancestors. Does that answer your question? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, I feel that. Um, I, as a, um, I remember as a little kid, I was really fascinated by the things I could find on the ground and in the earth. And I remember digging so deep in the sand at the city park that I found clay under the sand. And I remember having, I used to have these sort of like seizures of ecstasy when I was a child where I would be so amazed at the earth or the sky or some moment that I would be, I wouldn't be able to feel any pain in these moments of ecstatic joy. And that's how I felt when I found clay in the ground. And I remember thinking that anything was possible, that I, if I could find clay in the earth and that I could make something out of it, then anything was possible. And um, that's really an idea that's, that, that is a way of understanding my connection to the earth and to the sky that is still active in my practice today, that I'm asking a lot of my practice. I'm asking a lot of my studio. I'm asking a lot of myself when I'm in my studio. And for me, there is no not being in the studio. There is no not part of my breathing life. There's no part of the work that my lungs do that is not me actively investing and gathering ingredients for a creative process that becomes 
the sculptural products that becomes performance, but it also becomes me. So I recognize deep dimensional holistic process inside of my living and inside of my actual studio. And that is something that I hear you recognizing in, in the statement that you just read, that there is this, uh, there's the presence of time, there's a political presence, there's an ancestral, spiritual, celestial, cultural, um, but also a really grounded black girl presence, um, a complicated, a layered black girl presence in my work. And um, when I say black girl, I also say black femme, black women, um, I, as a queer artist, um, I claim uh, a, I claim a broad spectrum of titles, but uh, and I love how Toni Morrison said, you know, somebody asked her once, they were like, "Are you a black woman artist?" And she was, you know, she said, "Some people are get upset when they say black artist, black woman artist." She goes, "That just means I have this, I have um, the subject matter that I can touch upon is much broader than others." So. Um, I uh, would you like me to share some images from my studio? Yes, please. Some images of work. So uh, I'm not sure what order these are going to show up in because this is the first time I've screen shared. So I'll just talk about what we see. If you have any questions, if anybody has any questions, let me know. Um, or a place that you would like me to enter into talking about the work. Because any work that you see here, also you should, I want people to know that I can perform the work also. So if it's a sculpture, if it's a painting, there is part of that that is, um, that I am able to embody physically and actually perform. So I can perform all of this work. So let's see what we have first. Oh, okay. So in uh, in when the pandemic began um i started painting uh, but well i think a couple of months for maybe six months before march 11th which is the date that the pandemic was declared i became really interested um deeply interested in butterflies and in moths um when my mother died like probably 11 days before my mother died i asked her i said mommy um, when you die, if it is at all possible, would you send me a would you send me a message? And she said, "Well, what do you want?" And we talked about all these messages, and um, and it came to pass that the day of my mother's memorial, which was seven days after she passed, this message that we talked about had um, and more than talked about this message that we worked on together spiritually and in physical with, with our conversation, it came to pass. And there was this huge moth in my house. It was about the size of my hand, which um, in the region that I live in should not happen. That moth should not have been there, but it was in my house and it stayed around and it was this really powerful experience. So I have been interested in uh, the consciousness of butterflies, the consciousness of moths, and the consciousness really of everything around us, because there's this idea in my ancestral past where you're, um, you make agreements with all these dimensions of consciousness uh, before you come into your human form to have special relationships, whether it's with plants or with animals, all those consciousness, uh, all of those beings of conscious are in, in agreement together. So I really became um, obsessed with this idea that uh, how a caterpillar will completely consume itself and be transformed into the butterfly and how there's no remnant of the caterpillar before. So I created, started creating these sort of strange uh, butterfly creatures um, as a form of channeling and as a form of healing. And there's one of them on the screen right now. There's gonna be others that we see. So I'm just gonna show you some images. If anybody has any questions, let me know. But um, the pictures might jump around. Cool, Naima, am I still cool? You are good money. Keep All right, so, so the next picture that you're gonna see is a wall sculpture. Um, just for scale, this is eight, this is, actually nine feet tall. It's nine feet tall, it's five feet wide. It's called Homo Galacticus in Flight. And one of the things that I am working on in that sort of dimensional process that I talked about in my studio is um, this place of reckoning. One of the things that is happening on the streets in America right now, because you can't, 
um, stand on the neck and suffocate a people without them having de having uprising, without literally pushing up against and they're unfolding a reckoning. So I think about creating objects into a reckoning and into um, the sort of future of the reckoning. So this piece is called Homo Galacticus in Flight, and it holds the space for the time when we see ourselves not as um, citizens simply of a city or a country or even the planet Earth, but that we are in relationship with an entire galaxy. And then how then do we inhabit our identity as galactic citizens? And inside of this image, um, you can see these eyes staring out. And I think about how um, your people are with you everywhere you go. And as my freedom, the freedom that I have on the streets, I also carry my ancestors with me. Um, inside of every step and breath that I take. They are free through me. Uh, so, uh, so more interesting, I call them creatures of flight. And you'll notice that they start to sort of take on the hippie shape of a woman. I remember uh, my mother was a very hippie wide woman. And I remember the women she used to have uh, meetings with when I was a kid in LA were all women with big hips. And I remember thinking to myself, that's how I know a woman is important. I know a woman is important because she got these big hips. This is another work that this is all this, this is all new work. This is all work from um, actually this year, this is all 2020 work. This is a work called The Embrace. And I was thinking about a young man who um, uh, killed, killed himself in the neighborhood. And I was thinking about how uh, he was so young and I wondered uh, if he had fallen in love. And I wondered if whoever he had fallen in love with, um, the world would accept his loving. And I thought about how few images I see of, of, of real tenderness between black males inhabiting the sort of full adorned treasure of their identities. So this has been inspired by The Kiss and it, it's called The Embrace. And everything in the work means something. Sometimes people look at my work and they're like, you threw everything but the kitchen sink in there. And I'm like, if I wanted the kitchen sink, the kitchen sink would be in there and it would be in there on purpose. But everything means something. Um, I think about the color gold. I think about drawing gold from the earth. I think about how um, Ghana was the first place to, in Africa to import other Africans to mine gold. Um, but also, what would it, how differently our lives would be if we were actually treated as though we were worth our weight in gold? So everything in the work means something. I'll just flip through some other images. These are more wide body creatures of flight, creatures of flight. Sculptural work in with the panel work. So the panels, uh, the sculptures that you saw first, the Homo Galacticus in flight and the embrace are wall works, but in I also create power figures. This power figure that you see here is uh, from an army. I don't create singular discrete objects anymore. I create entire, entire armies of power figures um, because they are meant to be powerful and to be active. And I think about how we give so much power in our imaginations to the idea of a militarized force, an army, a police force, but what about an army of black uh, feminized power figures that have powers that are um, both visible and invisible? This is a piece called Black Girl with Snakes. And I'm thinking about that connection about black girls and the earth and dirt and creatures of the earth and being in conscious relationship with them. This is a black girl carrying many mirrors, totally um, heavily encrusted in an armor of ormolu and ceramic flowers, um, but also in communion with these creatures, these reptile creatures. And there's, in the work that I study, there's this place where you a uh, hold balance between your reptilian brain, your spiritual brain, and uh, but you do not let the reptilian brain like take over. 
but that you can be in relationship. But it is also recognizing the fact that as a little black girl, I was surrounded by snaky people. I was surrounded by people who lied to me, who wanted to touch my panties, who wanted to do, um, who wanted to reduce me to something to be underneath their foot. And I remember my, the ways that my mother told me that I was a valuable human being was by fighting people who would do that to me. <laughs> and so I just reckon, you know, in the figure you see that she's actually surrounded by snakes, but she's floating and she is holding her own. And um, I love this piece, <laughs> Black Girl with Snakes. Uh, I'll just scroll through some images. This is setting up at the art show at the Armory in New York. And I love behind the scenes photos of art. Really, really quick. Um, there's been a question about the material of the gold color. Yes. Does it vary from piece to piece? Um, well, I'll speak specifically about the piece that you saw. So the piece in Homo Galacticus in Flight and in the Embrace, what I do is I am actually laying a lace fabric, a gold sort of embroidered fabric that um, is like specialty gown fabric that I got from the garment district in LA. And so that goes on a painted gold surface. And then I layer on um, a hybrid glitter with gold beads. And then there are all these other pieces of gold jewelry, old broken jewelry. There are a lot of, um, uh, the Saint Fatima medals in that where the children had a vision of the Virgin and so it is actually deeply layered. It's layers and layers of gold that creates that. Thank you for the question. And I'm just going to finish out these images. That's a shot of Homo Galacticus in flight in my studio, nine feet tall. The 50 above the head is from a shooting range, a target shooting range. And um, there's secrets inside of all of the work. So if you get closer and closer to the work, the work is going to, um, the work is going to sort of um, reach a tentacle into your curiosity. So I love the idea that the work is an adventure in sight and that people look at the patterns, they follow the rhythm, they follow the pattern, they look at all of the objects and by simply looking at the object, you become mesmerized. And in that place of mesmeration, you can enter a spiritual space and an intellectual space that isn't mainstream, that can allow you to ingest the work dimensionally uh, for your spiritual self, your soul self, your political self, your cultural self, without creating divisions between them. So in the adventure of sight, it is also an experience of travel. It's, a, it's as though the sight is an adventure into the self. Um, other work from the show, my show at Fort Gansevoort this fall in New York. It's a work called Heavy, inspired by Kise Lemon's um, the book Heavy. And, and when I say I can perform any of the work, this is, I will often, if one of my installations travels to a city, I uh, work with lots of community groups in a city and we will do a set of rituals. So this was the 100th anniversary, the uh, memorial for the 100th anniversary of the lynching of Will Brown in Omaha, Nebraska, um, what they call the largest race riot in America. And a group of artists and I went throughout the entire community. And I think I have more pictures of it. And we walked through we walked the route that they, that they um, drug Will Brown's body and we reclaimed that space with joy and with grief. And it was, um, I think we walked like two, the two mile route. And I make all of these blue garments, uh, mostly in the hotel rooms when I'm on, I'm on the road a lot. And so I make a lot of clothes in hotel rooms. And so, and these clothes represent all these different cities that I have traveled in across the country. And so, um, and I really, what is really important to me is that people know that the truest love that I know in my life, the truest love that I know as a human being, I know through the process of creating art. If I have any courage at all, it's because I am able to, um, I am able to be in communication with my soul in a world that really denies the power and the presence of the soul on a daily basis. Uh, and uh, thank you, Naima, for this time. I feel like I've taken a lot of time. I um, wanted to say I'm so grateful to be here with you and with other Black women artists, which is a really rare experience for me. So I'm grateful. Thank you.
Well, thank you. So I'm so you're glad that you're here. I thought I, I feel like I just talked. I thought I thought we was gonna have a conversation. We are. <laughs> We're each gonna have like a moment that we can talk about oh, what we're doing. Yellow Obama and you at the same time, and we were just gonna have a conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Me too, but it's okay. We're doing that too. We're doing and everywhere. And <laughs> not for. Hey. All right. I'm Alicia Piller is born and raised in Chicago and received her bachelor's in fine arts, painting and anthropology from Rutgers University. While working in the fashion industry, Piller cultivated her distinct sculptural voice. Continuing to expand her artistic practice, Alicia recently completed her MFA focused on sculpture and installation at California Institute of the Arts. As a method to locate the root of human histories, Alicia merges the new and discarded experimenting with a wide range of materials to construct large-scale works that mimic forms of cellular biology. Pillar envisions historical traumas, both political and environmental, through the lens of a microscope. Her multimedia practice is as much about materiality as it is about content. Attempting to reconcile questions about the current state of our time, she works on a micro and micro level, breathing life into materials that have been removed from their natural environment. Manipulating things like resin and latex balloons, stemming from her background as a clown, which maybe she'll talk about, uh, mm -hmm. each work becomes a biological unfolding of time, examining the energy around wounds society has inflicted upon themselves and others. Um, I also want to say, yes, Shy Town is in the building. Yes. <laughs> Hello, Carrion. Hello, Makisha, uh, and everybody else from Chicago that I don't see in the chat. Please be in the chat. I enjoy the chat. Anyway, um, I do want to say that for me, so I learned about uh, Alicia years and years ago um, in Brooklyn. There was a boutique. If you know, then you know. Harriet's Alter Ego. Major, major, huge, huge, huge shout out to my Harriet's Alter Ego family. Ngozi Odita, um, Hakima Hapa, and everybody else that was in and around at that time. So we're talking like 2004, 2005. You date me. <laughs> <laughs> a long time ago. I'm old. Imagine. Anyway, um, I wanted to really highlight that because I feel like at that time she was making jewelry. I'm I'm also I never asked your pronouns. Is she correct? Yeah, she her. Okay. All right, thanks. Um, so so at that time, I remember looking at the jewelry and thinking, hmm. <laughs> And then there were also t-shirts and everybody was rocking the neck pieces, the earrings. I had a pair of earrings. Sadly, I have no idea where they've disappeared to. But maybe about a year to nine months ago, I somehow stumbled, I think because of um, Danae, mm -hmm. Danae posted something and I was like, oh snap, <laughs> Alicia P designs? is still making sculptures and now they're like 10 times the size of these earrings that we used to wear. I'm so here for it. And it's the same language, kind of like blown up into this beautiful and important sculpture. I can't, I'm so, I was so, I made like a post in my stories about it because I was so excited to see that you had continued to build upon that work and build on those ideas. So um, I just really wanted to have you here. Um, no, I really appreciate that because I feel like most people who know what I do now don't know what I did then and don't understand. So actually, thank you so much. I'm so, I just, I'm honored. And this is literally like a bright spot in my year. Um, it's been a crazy year. Um, so I'm Alicia. I am a mixed media artist based here in LA currently. And um, I am going to talk about my journey into sculptural form. And I love that you bring up the fashion because we're going there. Mm -hmm. um, me, I'm gonna go straight to the photos. Give me one second. Okay, can you see that? Mm -hmm. Okay. So like you said, while I was at Rutgers in New Jersey, I studied anthropology and painting and I was really interested in this human connection to cultural practices and and nature um and also really thinking about my own connection to nature and connection to the world so 
I was, while I'm working on these paintings, um, hold on, let me make sure I can scroll. Okay, there we go. Um, again, you can see my connection to nature in these works. These are like 15 years old. But while I was doing this, this painting work, I was still really heavily involved in my craft background because growing up, I was sewing, I was weaving, I was doing everything with my mother and my grandmother and my great grandmother. And I couldn't get away, even though I love painting, I couldn't get away from working with tactile materials. So back when I began my journey with, with three dimensional form, it really started with fashion. And I was exploring form mainly, not even really considering content, but that came into play as I was collecting objects. And I'm a little bit of a hoarder, but in a good way. And I am constantly um, collecting and, and, and not just collecting, but wanting to know the history of each material. And my practice really started to begin then in this fashion world where I'm wrapping, ritually wrapping each object um, in, at the time, leather and now vinyl, but each object was ritually wrapped because I was creating on a cellular level, piecing together piece by piece by piece these objects to create a larger work. And that really started my understanding of, I mean, I'm already very spiritual, but what does it mean to piece these objects together? What power comes from adornment and what power comes from literally placing objects with a history together? So these then began to grow. <laughs> and um, again, I really wasn't even thinking about sculpture. I was thinking about adornment and pulling in all my craft practices, the weaving, pulling in my, my fine arts, my painting, that, that's like a pan painted snake. Um, and again, continuing to explore and experiment. So over time, the content aspect really started to, I'm like, okay, I've got the form down, I've got my aesthetic, but what am I talking about, you know? And so um, I started to recycle in a lot of these old works and then pull in my, again, my past, which was my clown, my, I was a professional clown with my mother and we, I was doing balloon sculptures. So I really was drawn to this latex balloon element because it, it had this bodily sense, but also the celebratory sense, but also it just brought up a lot of familiar feelings that were, uh, again, celebratory, but also what does it mean to try to preserve something that maybe, you know, can't be preserved. So I'm really, I was starting to sort of get more into my content. Um, and that led to, again, with me and my collections, I started to rescue what I consider rescuing um, these racist artifacts. And so I had found these swizzle sticks that were just disgusting and created a body of work that was surrounded by, by these swizzle sticks, but dissecting them, cutting them apart, reconfiguring them, and I was still in this fashion zone. So this piece is almost like this giant earring and I was thinking about the black female body and the weight of history of us having to carry a, a, this specific history. And while I'm doing this work, um, you know, I was really trying to get to a question, the, honing in on what is my practice about? My practice is about how did we get here today? And to do that, I'm looking back to history. I'm thinking specifically about American history and colonialism. And this special breed of racism and, and capitalism that we have. And, and in this, I then went to CalArts. And so this was my first show, my first solo show there. Um, and I was thinking about skin cells. So what you're looking at is balloons, but skin shaped into what I consider skin cells bursting out of this warped canvas, which is an American flag. And um, this was, again, the beginnings of me sort of diving deep into this uh, American past. And so for my thesis show, which was called Permutations, I had 13 interconnected works that were me zooming out to look at this colonial era and this very specific historical time, but also to zoom in to my own maternal DNA. And to do that, I was using um, an image of four generations, my mother, her mother, her mother, her mother, 
over and over and over again repetitively to try to capture a sense of time. And I was, and here's uh, one of the largest sculptures in that show. And it's made up of my latex balloons, but also um, this, that image. And also you can see a little bit here, the, the, the image over and over again, but also my mother's actual percentages of her DNA. So I was really thinking about the probability of existence from this terrible history and the fact that I'm here because of that, but in the beauty and the ugliness that all comes from all of this history. So then also in the show, I have this, and this pertains to my practice in general. I'm again, always going back to nature. So I had, as I'm walking to school every day, to grad school, I'm encountering uh, seeds, these sycamore seeds that are in the shape of an earth form and in the shape of a round ball. And each one is made up of thousands of little seeds. And so I started to dissect those seeds and lay them out and photograph them and then reconfigure them into new forms. So this became this metaphor for cultures, for people, for nature, for um, nations. And I was, what does it mean to go into a place and literally tear it apart and reconfigure it into something new? So that trope kind of carried, has carried on throughout my work. Um, and so in my most recent solo show, it was called Spirit of the Times. And I, again, incorporated a lot of those nature elements. But this show was really about looking at the past, the present, and the future. And here's the larger, this is the whole piece of that one. Um, and then thinking about how, uh, actually what I was doing was, really curating the imagery that I was using even more, like taking that to another level. So I was researching, collecting, and then incorporating headlines from the past 200 years. Um, this work was a carcass you could, a, a sort of whale-shaped carcass you could walk into, and you were, I'm sorry, you were seeing the headlines from starting from present day going all the way back to in the 1800s dealing with racism and gun violence so i was really thinking about putting these things to rest um but this show really and oh here's a smaller work um this is called spirit of the past this has like a human human teeth a bullet casing a caricature a racist caricature from um the early 1900s and just embodying what is this past look like what the unseen energy around a history how can i manifest that materially um but to but with that element of the show it, it it also was me recycling in all of that trash all the waste from those works to make the future to make the new work because to me it's not about forgetting the past it's about how do we create something new from um, a new energy from this past without just forgetting it, without ignoring it. And I was thinking about new cities, new, new frames of mind. And yeah, that's in a nutshell what my practice is about. Um, and I love, honestly, Vanessa, the overlap, because I'm, I'm always thinking about uh, this spiritual element and, and our connection to ancestors, our connection to the planet. And that's why there's always this nature element within the sculptural work, even if I am talking about something dealing with human, human beings. Um, yeah, I don't know if anybody has some questions. I'm, I'm willing. <laughs> well, we'll get to like questions and we'll frame it in a way that we're bringing everybody back together. Um, there weren't really questions, but lots of like, so amazing, powerful work um, <laughs> in the chat, if you're not having a look at it. Um, so, O, almost yeah. your time. Um, Omolaro Williams McAllister, pronouns O, love, beloved, is a fiber-based artist who has been based in the DC, Maryland, and Virginia area for nine years. Omolaro was born and raised in Atlanta, Georgia. Atlanta's rich traditions Black arts, Black history, and Black culture continue to be a major influence on O's practice as an artist, educator, facilitator, and community organizer. As an artist, Omolara is primarily concerned with catalyzing social interactions. 
owes sculptural performance, installation, speculative fiction writing, and other works are spatial interventions. These spatial interventions create conditions for reshaping social interactions, upsetting existing power dynamics, and rewriting existing social scripts. Do you want me to read your artist statement as well? I would like to. Um, to <laughs> yeah, if you'd like, that's fine. Adornment as ritual, as meditation, as armor, as preparation, as self-determination, self-actualization, self-preservation, as a reclaiming of space, a rewriting, a rewriting. Adornment as a way to say I exist, I exist as me, ain't shit you can say about it, so get the fuck out of my way. I use adornment of bodies and spaces to uplift the personhood of Black people whose bodies are policed, politicized, and rendered powerless. I used adornment technology, spelled T-E-K-N-O-L-O-G-Y, traditional ecological knowledge as a tune as a tool for personal and collective liberation through self-actualization and the visioning of possible futures, ladies and gentlemen, and everyone else of all genders, I give you, oh. Hi. So I also was like, oh, we're gonna do separate talks. So I'm gonna um, put together a couple of different groupings of images that aren't necessarily in uh, a single slideshow and just kind of they don't have to be. Okay, great. Um, I'm really excited in general just to say like, I always like to shout out amazing curation. I'm really thankful for to you for curating this moment because I feel a bit like I'm time traveling as I'm on the panel where I'm like, oh, okay, I can see a possible future for me there. That's really nice because generally um, I can feel a little isolated in my practice within the fine arts world, within the arts and organizing world. And so it's really nice to be on this panel with Alicia and Vanessa uh, because I see so much of myself and my future possible self reflected there. So I think that's really amazing. So I wanna start with the first piece that I ever made. That's a lie, because sure, there were pieces before this piece, but we're going to pretend like this was the first piece that I ever made. Um, Fishers of Men. And I think I'm screen sharing properly, right? You yeah. see like a beach and- You're good, you're good. Okay, great. Um, yeah, I mean, I grew up, I talked about Atlanta in my biographic statement. It's really important to me and to um, my work that I grew up in a black church uh, with black liberation theology and also with a really, really rich arts and culture tradition. And so that tradition of kind of like singing is where I started singing. So I have this music background and that was where I started kind of theorizing and understanding, um, I mean, about blackness, but really just about like our place in the world. I mean, Atlanta is a black city, so black becomes kind of a um, less of a a thing that has to be stated and more of a thing that's known, you know. But you know that you're black when you grow up in Atlanta and you're steeped in black art and black tradition. And then I had this wonderful mom who navigated many issues of kind of mental health and presence. Um, but when she was present, she definitely introduced me to kind of textile traditions um, and fiber work, both in the fact that she was just an amazing seamstress who made all of my clothes. So I kind of grew up being able to be like, here is a sketch, you know, a child sketch of what I want to wear. And then, you know, it would magically become a real garment. And these were like, I mean, I guess fashion sketches are ridiculous anyway, but whatever, you know, this was like a small child being like, it's red, it has polka dots, it goes out, this is what I want. You know, so I started from an early age having this ability to kind of create the world around me and being introduced to really interesting and rich materials. So my mom, through my mom's various work, so she was a seamstress and then she was an auto mechanic and then she was a professional rodeo cowgirl doing barrel racing. So there's like knot tying and ropes and leather and horse hair that comes in there. And so a lot of this kind of materiality and interaction with these kinds of materials shows up in the way that I do work. So fast forward, I grew up, became an adult, I went to an arts high school. Um, I ended up working on this project, Question Bridge Black Males, which was done by a four-person art 
collective, uh, mostly based out of New York. So it was um, Christopher Johnson, Bayade Ross Smith, Hank Willis Thomas, and Kamal Sinclair. Uh, um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I did that right. <laughs> and I was working on their national community engagement. And the first time that I saw that piece, which is really, really relevant now, I believe the website is still active, so go look at it. Um, I just sat and cried. And it was this image of these men kind of having this conversation, but having it from places of isolation, black men. Um, and one of my responses to the piece was kind of like, what would that look like if I had a conversation with myself and in my communities about black womanhood? Um, which is complex in different ways for me as a person who is queer and also gender fluid. So while I identify as woman, I also identify as not woman um, in these kind of interesting ways. And so this piece was the first thing that I made. It occurred, it just popped into my brain and I was like, okay, we're going to make it. You know, it's made out of muslin scraps that are hand braided and then hand knotted into a fishnet in the form of kind of this body cast gown. And I'm really thankful to um, Chris Myers for collaborating with me to make images of this work. I'm thinking about this double bind of being caught, which I think has a lot to do with thinking through gender, um, the hypersexualization of black women as kind of sirens or people who lure people to their death at the rocks. Like I couldn't help myself because this person wanted it. You know, there are all of these narratives that surround black women's bodies. Um, and their availability. And then also thinking about um, fish markets and the actual selling of black women's bodies at fish markets as a part of slavery in the US South. Um, and also thinking about, you know, if there is this siren narrative, then what too is the power in that? And being able to take something and say, okay, like this is a vulnerability that you have to a thing that I possess. How can I flip this and make this possible for me? So mermaids show up a lot in uh, my work, though not necessarily in the work that is publicly consumed. And so I'd like to start with that piece because it really is, um, though I didn't think of it necessarily, it's about adornment and it's also about this kind of ritual making process that I've heard both Alicia and Vanessa speak to. I think there are a couple of my friends here in the chat who were probably around while I was braiding this. So I would carry it with me everywhere, basically. I'd have this gigantic bag and I'd have these muslin scraps. And whenever we were doing anything, I would be braiding this muslin and then knotting it and pulling it through, you know, and there'd just be like a puddle of something around me all of the time. That process of making in public, um, which, Vanessa mentioned too, the making it in, you know, hotel rooms and things like that. I don't be having hotel rooms, so it'll be like the bus, you know, <laughs> the meeting, the wherever it is that I am, there's a bag of something and I'm making it. Um, and I think that that's important too, because then there's a space for community conversation and also community input into that. So we're gonna go non-linearly because that is the thing that I tend to do and figure out how to- And time is a circle it. anyway. <laughs> the circle. Okay, I think I'm going to. Sh I'm sharing the thing that I want to share now. Yes, perfect. So um, after doing archival work for some time, I've gotten into a space of heavy documenting my work because I've seen in my process because I've seen how many gaps there are and how many questions I have um, about artists who I think of as in my lineage, either in terms of like practice or material or identity or whatever. So I document the crap out of it. And like I said, I didn't organize this, but this is my folder for um, a project that I'm actively working on, which you can also see part of here behind me in the shot that's called Domestic Work. And Domestic Work, the title is taken from a book of the same name by a former poet laureate Natasha Trethewey, who's also a black woman from the South. And the book is about her black women ancestors in the South, her grandmother, her great grandmother, um, their day to day lives and the particular poem, domestic work. You know, I always mean to have this book next to me and I'm looking at it across the room, but it's not next to me. Um, I'm gonna go get it because that feels important. I'll be right back. You all enjoy this too. <laughs> 
Um, just a reminder for those of you watching, again, thank you for being here. Feel free to take screen captures of us chatting, post them. Exactly. Thank you, Alicia, uh, for putting your Instagram. I'll type O's, myself, as well as Vanessa's in the chat now. Go on, O. Well, so this is the book, Domestic Work, Natasha Trethewey. Um, and I can spell that and put it in the chat. The poem is titled Domestic Work 1937. All week she's cleaned someone else's house, start seared down her own face in the shine of copper bottom pots, polished woods, toilets she pulled the lid to that look saying, let's make a change, girl. But Sunday mornings are hers, church clothes starched and hanging, a record spinning on the console, the whole house dancing. She raises the shades, washes the rooms in light, buckets of water, octagon, so if you're Southern, anyway. Um, cleanliness is next to godliness. Windows and doors flung wide, curtains two-stepping forward and back, neck bones bumping in the pot, a choir of clothes clapping on the line. Near my God to thee. She beats time on the rugs, blows dust from the broom, like dandelion spores, each one a wish for something better. So um, that poem, I think, for me, I connect, I connect a lot as a person raised and socialized as a Black woman in the Southern United States to other people who share that history, uh, even though my family on my dad's side is Nigerian and that's a really strong influence as well, the Yoruba, my mom's side is um, rooted in New Orleans. Uh, the, the domestic work, that particular poem, makes me think a lot about the kind of work that is expected and extracted from black women by society and the way that societal systems are kind of built on the expectation that we're going to constantly be doing this um, invisible, unacknowledged, but completely expected labor for, you know, you, for whoever the you is. And so in this time, um, in the coronavirus, this piece is expanded for a third time. So it's expanded. The initial project was for you, and I was thinking about the extraction of labor and the messaging in the work really speaks to that. So some of the subtext, which you can't see, in the piece behind me necessarily, but hopefully my screen is sharing and you can see it on the screen share. Um, there are kind of these individual messages that are uh, hand embroidered into the cloth that you see if you decide to come closer. So there's this super text and this subtext uh, that's happening. For me, proximity and positionality um, and perspective are really important parts of my work. So I think a lot about how people will experience it differently from a different distance or from a different space in a room or from their own position as a viewer, depending on what their uh, identities are or aren't, how they'll be able to understand and enter into the piece. So this started about extraction of labor um, from black women. And then I was challenged during a studio visit. Someone was like, this is heavy. This is really great, a wonderful piece. Um, and where's the transformation? Like as artists, do we always just drop heavy things on people? Do we pull people into um, something else? Like, what do we do? We just leave people in a pile and then you're like, oh, that's art, like I'm out, I did what I did. And so because of that person's um, person kind of pushing, I started developing another line of pieces which are for me. And so these ones aren't quite, um, it's so great to be in my studio because I can just walk over and pull out things, as, you know, which I wouldn't be able to do if we were in an actual panel. So these are kind of the waiting to be dyed and waxed. Um, there's a lot of processes that go into this piece. Um, pieces. So those ones say for me, you know, not one that I picked up that took time. And in Corona, I've really been thinking about, um, you know, the first part for you could be said to be about codependence and then you have the part for me which is a bit about in independence and then in coronavirus we're learning a lot those of us who haven't already been in interdependent relationships about interdependence and what it means to do things for us you know kind of for the communal good and so i've been spending time every day reflecting and talking with people about the things that we're doing for us for like the collective community what is my time looking like um, you are good, but I do want to make sure that we have, because I feel like it's already almost two right now somehow. 
Um, so I want to make sure that we are spending some time talking to each other um, and getting into some of these questions because I, of course, have questions that come to me as I've listened to each of you speak. So if you want to take like another two to three minutes, that's cool. Yeah, I'm going to take two to two to three minutes and I'm going to do this quick run through of this other stuff, which is what I thought that I would be talking about. Uh, adornment. So there was this statement made about adornment. A lot of my work, some of it you can see kind of on the wall or in the space behind me um, as well, focuses on adornment um, and like actual using it in lived spaces. And so again, a lot of domestic adornment has been my focus. Uh, now and it's interesting because I've been displaced to Dorchester um, by the coronavirus. So these images that I took were actually in the space that I was in in Baltimore. You know, I'm in a completely different space that's adorned. Um, most recently, my practice has moved towards looking at masquerades, uh, masquerade figures, and I'm using that term in defense of a West African masquerade and this kind of spiritual tradition of becoming um, God beings, essentially, through this intense kind of adornment. Uh, I feel like it, that's one of those things that's really hard to culturally translate because it's not, for, it's, in, it's embodied, you know, like, and now I am this person, not just pretending to be this person, not just um, acting like this person, but through this kind of process of ritual adornment, I become a vessel that is filled with this other being. And so earlier last year, actually, I started making fascinators because I just like doing the most with my own hair. And I got someone to pay for me to do an intro uh, course to that. And I thought that I was going to be making fascinators. And the first thing that I ended up making by myself after the course was this image here on the left with the, the cowrie veil. Um, and I was like, well, that is not a fascinator. That is not what that is. And then I kept having these other things kind of occur to me with different objects that I was encountering. So, you know, the first one has the cowrie shells and the traditional fascinator. This one has horseshoes, which are from a horse farm that I, you know, actively work on. And this is baling twine um, that's used I don't know how many people have actually interacted with a bale of hay that you like, like feed horses, but this is the twine that comes off of that. And so I've been using a lot of materials that I encounter. There's birch bark in this, um, here birch bark and raffia to create these masquerades that really just appear to me in dream space. And so I'm excited to talk about process with Alicia and Vanessa thinking about spirituality and intuitivity and ancestor work. Amazing. Okay, so there we go. Um, we're gonna switch to gallery view. Um, uh, I mean, thank you all so much um, for just spending the time and agreeing to do this today. It's really powerful, and I think um, I'm excited to to delve more into these connections directly. Um, so one of the things that I want to talk about with you all is just this way that I'm seeing this careful collection and curation of material um, in terms of how you're fashioning it into objects, into sculptures, into adornment in your case. And actually all of you ultimately are on the cusp of that in different ways. And I just wonder about the process of collecting those materials for each of you. Um. I'll go first. <laughs> um, I was really thinking about what Vanessa was saying earlier about how it's a living and a breathing of that. And um, that is really true for me as well. Like, it doesn't matter where I am or what I'm doing. I'm, I'm thinking in that realm always about um, anything that I'm looking at. I'm literally walking down the street. I'm at work. At work right now, I, I'm doing industrial silk, uh, screen printing and I'm collecting all the garbage. I'm collecting all the things that to me feel They're like, garbage. <laughs> well, you know, I'm breathing new life into it. But I mean, to me, there's always beauty in everything that I'm like, I'm, I'm always, like, I'm collecting, you know, and, and sometimes I don't use those pieces or use those things for years. Mm -hmm. um, in one of my images, I had a cue ball in the center of a big sculpture, and I've had that 
since t- 2004. Um, you know, and so it's about, you know, like I said, like I, I'm a hoarder, but they all get placed where they need to be placed at a certain point, you know. Um, but it's just keeping your your mind and your your creativity open to the world, really, because we live in this crazy world of, of you know, weird objects and I don't know. Go ahead, somebody else. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess mine is similar. So the first piece that I showed, which was the, uh, the Fishers of Men is the title of it um, from the Bible, come with me and I will make you fishers of men. That's another story. But uh, the muslin scraps from that piece are collected from the costume shop that I was working at at the time. So for a while I worked as a costume fabricator and there were lots of scraps similar to uh, your story, Alicia. And I did end up having to buy muslin for that piece, which made me sad, but um, it started as scrap work. And then for other materials, I feel like there's this uh, tension in some ways between the found materials that I have and the ones that I buy from the store. I feel a different sense of connection to them and they speak to me very differently. So uh, one of the pieces I showed, I guess one of the latter ones, which is the one with the horseshoes and the bailing twine, uh, you know, like I was volunteering on a, a horse farm while I was at Vermont Studio Center, which is a, a residency space for artists. And I knew that I needed something that would anchor my daily rituals. So, and I knew that I was in horse country. So I went and found some horses because I'm a horsey person. And I just started collecting this bailing twine and I'd had these horseshoes that I'd collected from some work. So I also do natural horsemanship, um, groundwork training. And I'd been doing some training around that in Spain and whenever the um, farrier came, the person who shoes the horses, I'd just be like, hey, can I have those horseshoes? You know, and he would give me his entire load of horseshoes. So I kind of brought about 60 horseshoes back to the United States in my carry-on over the span of a couple of years. And so I feel like, yeah, it's this, this process of um, collecting, but I would say that it's it's selected, like it doesn't feel hoarding. For me, they're particularly charged materials. Like the most recent thing that I've collected was um, towards the beginning of coronavirus. And this kind of sucks because I was like, should I collect it, should I not collect it? I really want this thing. For some reason, there were all these corn cobs on the street um, or in this park in the space in Baltimore where I live, just north of North Ave. There's like this tiny park that butts up against the end of Mount Royal Street. Um, for Baltimore people, some of you are here. And I don't know why there were all these corn cobs on the ground, but there were just corn cobs on the ground and they had aged. And so they turned this really rich burgundy color, but they also had this yellow and the the texture of the cobs and the color of them really spoke to me. So, you know, I rode my bike past them a couple days and then I brought a bag and I brought some gloves and I was just like, you know, we're going to pray that I don't get some terrible thing from these corn cobs, but you know, those corn cobs are with me in my closet here in Dorchester as are the remainder of those horseshoes. So um, yeah, the materiality is really important. And a lot of the work that I'm doing is in response to materials. And just as a last note, I've made a lot of intention to move to a zero waste practice that was very close to zero waste and also towards sustainable and sustainably sourced materials. So in my millinery practice, for example, or some of my head adornment making, I started moving from millinery wire to rattan um, because it's more sustainable. And so some of the material choices are also informed by ethics. I will start by uh, just picking up, Alicia used the word hoarder. She said, I'm a hoarder, it's like this. I would like to challenge that. I actually don't think you're a hoarder. I think that you're collecting the ingredients. That yes, speak- no, it's just my cute way, but I, I know. <laughs> what I say is that hoarding is, con- when there's an actual obsessive hoarder, it's connected to mental illness. And uh, well, it, it can be a mental illness, it can be, Uh, somebody hoards through their trauma, but I will, so I will say, I honor the fact that what I hear you saying is you collect 
and you have an abundance. You have an archive. So you, my mother would love you because my mother collected so much fabric. She had this bumper sticker that says, she who dies with the most fabric wins. So yes. <laughs> the spirit of- I may interject really quickly. I'm sorry, but I think this is important, particularly in connection to um, what O was saying about West African masquerade tradition. So many of those are directly connected to like these ideas of if you're collecting this kind of fabric, then you are, you know, and if, if those are in your igungun honoring your ancestors, if you have like the fine silks and the velvets and the so on, like there's direct connections to these ideas of exoneration, right? Okay, I'm done. <laughs> Continue, Vanessa. Um, uh, um, uh, sorry. Um, so when I collect, um, I basically, what I have is something that I call the technology of my soul, which means I trust my instincts. I'm gonna get whatever I want to get. I'm gonna get how much of it I want to get. Um, I don't throw stuff away. The earth doesn't throw things away. That's, uh, it's a new idea. The idea of garbage is really new. Um, it's not something, it's really something that I try to not contribute a whole lot to the world and I can use, I use so much material in my work, but I trust myself, I trust my instincts and I trust the technology of my soul, which means, as Alicia said, you, I might have, I have stuff in my studio that I've had for 20 years and even the sight of it is inspiring. So when it shows up in a work, it shows up in a work, but if it's in my studio and it's contributing to the ecosystem of my process, then it's still doing work. So technology of my soul, I trust my instincts and I trust the dimensions that are happening and I'll collect anything. One of the most, one of the strangest things I found was um, when I, my show was touring through Montana, I found a shopping cart full of AK-47 rifle handles. I have them all. Yep. <laughs> I think one of the other things for me as I look at each of your practices individually and together one of the things that I'm thinking about is time um, and thinking about this idea of collapsing and corralling time in some ways I wonder what you all think about that I'll answer first, just really quickly. One of the ways I say that the work works is in the simultaneity of time, since time uh, is something that is so useful to us as human beings because it marks our experience, but um, it, is, uh, it exists in one plane. So I activate my work and my practice, and I recognize that my life is active in the simultaneity of time, in the past, present, and the future. I, one of the questions I hate getting at Artist Talks is how much time did that take? Um, and what my answer is all of the time that it took, <laughs> that's how much time it took. Um, but I'll give like finer answers if somebody really wants to know, but I am thinking about how inside of my DNA, my ancestors are present. So how do I communicate with that presence? If they're there, um, it is not a wasted cell. It is not a wasted presence. Let me be in deep communication, even though the world around me says that that is um, insanity, psychosis, mental illness, or whatever. I don't care. I think war is crazy. Um, so I am in communication with the past, and I also believe that I have definitely thrown messages to myself from the future. I have saved my own life from the future, and it's a, and so that's something that uh, I am always active in the simultaneity of time. I love that phrasing and that language for it because I am definitely moving through time in a very similar way. Uh, but I do, I have had to track time in my process uh, for a couple of reasons. And also hearing what Vanessa was saying about space, kind of some of my thinking is I'm just like, wow, I'm excited to get to a place where I can kind of keep all of the things. My life has been so characterized by forced displacement really and um, housing insecurity. I mean, I'm literally in the middle of that right now. You know, like I built this shelf this morning because I was like, I need to build things to make this space uh, my own. And I'm in the process of doing that as being displaced. And so the collecting of things, which is really important to me and to my practice is also influenced by that, you know, where it's like when I decide what to grab, you know, 
and I'm thankful to my friends and loved ones who helped me in the moving who aren't like, really? You, <laughs> you know, like, you're going to leave this thing, but you go bring these 40 horseshoes? Because I'm like, yes, the horseshoes are coming. The corn cobs are coming. I'm only bringing one pair of shoes, but I have those two things. I think um, time is similar for me. I have people are like, wow, that's a really um, intricate process. And it is, but I think we have patience for the things that are important to us, but it's not even necessarily patience. It's just, it's similar to what Vanessa said, it's almost a portal, like it's just a, a stepping into it. So like this piece has been in process since fall of 2008 and it's just in process, you know, like it's just continuing. At the same time, um, also in terms of like work and capitalism and having to work, um, I do, and because of my very loose grasp on time as a concept, I do end up timing portions of my process so that I can have an understanding realistically of what it might look like, like what the time, span, the time span of making a work might look like for me. So, you know, I know that it takes me about an hour to do the subtext embroidery on each of these pieces. I know that it takes me um, an hour to do the waxing subtext on each of these individual pieces. Um, I made a large noose knit sculpture that showed a lot this year. I know that it took me 12 minutes to tie each strand of tin nooses because when I was working to make those pieces, I kind of had to stretch my life around my practice because it's the thing that sustains me and keeps me alive. And so I'd be like, okay, how much time am I setting aside for my practice? And what does that mean that I'll be able to get done? Um, but I time those things precisely because my grasp on time is so loose. Because otherwise I'd be like, yeah, this will be done in two weeks. Because for me, it feels like that. But really, it's been, you know, three years. <laughs> but um, I think part of what I'm also asking is in your choices of materials, there is some element of time being looked at as well and troubled as well. In the choice of materials, how so? For example, um, you showed us, I guess, what did you refer to it as? You, this is the thing you were like, this is not a fascinator. I don't know what this is, but I'm going to make it anyway. Uh, <laughs> that, that object. Um, and just the choice to use cowries. Like, we have understandings of things based on something, right? Like these ideas don't just come to us from nowhere. That that's indirect conversation with those who came before us, with this knowledge that came before us. You see what I'm saying? Oh, oh, that part of time. Yeah, I mean, I would echo to what uh, what Vanessa said. I mean, I don't know that time is a relevant or useful construct. Like in my brain, like when you talk about time in that way, I'm like, kind of what? So I, I really like that term that uh, Vanessa used, the simultaneity mm -hmm. of time, because yeah. it rings really true for me. Yeah. A thing that's really present at very particular, particularly when I'm doing the masquerade work. I swear to God, I have no idea where it comes from. Um, you know, I'll be making it, and then sometimes I'm going to just... I'm just Really? You know where? Well, well, I mean, not no idea, but it's very different. Like this sort of work and the first work that I showed you, they were so well planned, you know, where I was like, this is what I'm making. And then I made them and I did all the little things to make them. And I was really accustomed to that being my process. Mm -hmm. Like I have a picture in my head. I'm going to make the picture in my head. The installation work is going to look like that. And that was most of the work that I came into 2019 doing because that masquerade showed up at the beginning of 2019. That's how I worked. And then when that masquerade showed up, I was like, what is this? Like, really, really, I was like, what? Okay, I'm going to make it. Like, it doesn't make sense to me what I'm being asked to do, but I'm going to do it. And that's fine. And so it's been really actually disorienting mm -hmm. to, to actually shift my process to that because it's like, oh, we don't know when things are getting done. I don't know what's done. I don't even know what I'm making. Like, somebody's like, what are you making? I'm like, I will know when it's done. I mean, ain't nothing wrong with that. You done? And I'm like, I don't know when it will be done. There is nothing wrong with that, in my personal opinion. Um, Alicia? Yeah. Um, you know, I think 
time comes into play in a lot of layers in my work. Um, number one, I do spend a lot of time making very intricate, large pieces and um, there's a performative aspect of that. For me, like I'm not a performer, but that just that labor becomes evident in the actual final piece. To me, that's performative in itself. Um, then there's this other layer of, number one, the materials, like where did I get this from? What time period was this thing from? And, and really considering that history of that piece, that object, um, and that combination of objects into one thing, that, that specifically is super important. Um, but then also there's this other layer of thinking about our connective, our, our humanity's connection to the universe. And, um, and on a really like, you know, metaphysical level, like what does that mean? Where do we sit in the grand scheme of time? Um, and a lot of times I get, I, I can go really far into that and think, you know, everything that we're doing here doesn't matter, but then it does. And then there's just, I, I'm constantly thinking about that past, present, future that I was talking about before, because to me, it's always present. Yeah. So speaking of present, um, I have a, a question about what so this is actually two questions. So um, Dominique asked something that I think is important and this kind of ties into my question as well. Thinking about the experience of a person that's looking at your work. Like what, what do you hope for them to, to see? And I think um, for, for all of you really, stages is different stages of perception for the work depending on like literal physical distance away from it and your ability to sort of hone in on certain elements of what you're including materially um and also you know like i was saying about vanessa's work when you first see it if you are black and you are rooted in a certain way you understand what you're seeing and i think you know some of what you're talking about um alicia within the context of of placing certain objects together because they tell a story about america's history that also is not something that everybody's going to be able to perceive immediately um, so I just wonder about that that process. Also, um, Dominique's question is, where do you want the work to live? Institutions, private collections, are you willing to revisit it, especially since it's so delicate and might need to be fixed or treated through wear and tear, black ownership, white ownership? Are you also including written material into the context? I know that was like a lot, but do your best. I want to go first. <laughs> I'll go first. Um, you know, I think, what what was the first part of the question before the where do I want it to live? It was. Yeah. So I'm asking about what do you, what do you want for the viewer to experience? Oh. Because there's so many layers. So for, yeah. for me, I think, um, you know, I am trying to, for my audience to be a very multicultural experience. I want people to enter in and not feel excluded. I want there to be that moment, but I also want you you know, so there's this element of when you look back from it, you're like, wow, what is that? It's so colorful. It's so whatever. But then when you come up into it, when you enter the piece, you're seeing human teeth, you're seeing a bullet casing, you're seeing these poignant objects or imagery that pulls you into the real story. So in a weird, in a way, I'm kind of like, I'm drawing you in with beauty sometimes, sometimes not, but a lot of times there is that element and I'm okay with that. But when you get into it, you're able to dive a little deeper. So I am trying to um, get the attention of multiple people, you know, and multiple classes of people. And, you know, that's hard to do, but it's, I'm, I'm trying. And then in terms of um, where do I want it to live? I mean, that's a very, that's hard. It's a hard question, but because at the end of the day, you know, I spend so much time making the things I, I need money sometimes, you know, so there have been times where I've sold some stuff and I'm like, should I have done that? You know, but I don't regret anything because it's all a learning lesson. It's all part of my journey. But ultimately, I want my work to be able to live in a place where 
everyone can experience it. Not one person necessarily. Um, but I'm willing to take commission. So, you know, so, so it's like these, there's like, I got to live, but I also want to um, share the work with everyone. So it's hard. Whoever else. I keep trying to hold on to the first part of the question and losing it. <laughs> like, All good. Um, I can attempt to repeat it. So uh, just this question of what do you want the viewer to experience? Because there's multiple stages of perception. And in your case, where in some of the cases of what you're making, things are actually wearable, right? So um, what do you want the person being adorned to experience? What do you want the person looking at the person being adorned to experience? And that may vary from piece to piece for sure. But I just wonder about the sort of overarching view for you. Yeah, that's definitely changed for me over time. So I think I mentioned that I come from a theater background and a performing background. And originally the pieces that I was making, um, thinking about that siren piece, thinking about the new snit piece, I was, I guess, really trying to create this theater, you know, this theater moment for people to have this experience of part of what I hear Alicia uh, talking about, which I call seduction, you know, where it's like, you pull people into this piece with kind of the super text. This one literally has super text. And then they get there and they're confronted with the subtext and kind of uh, sit with it. And so it used to be about creating this um, experience maybe of reckoning potentially for people, I think. Um, also, there's a lot of it for me isn't necessarily, I, again, thinking about time for a present artist, but thinking about um, archiving certain types of like practices or materials or histories of materials through the use of them. And so the materiality is really important to me and the history of the materials. So working with cotton a lot and working with indigo a lot and working with certain practices, um, actual, the practice of fish netting, for example, and who does that, you know, who was doing that, but also equally interested in news tying, like people didn't have Google. Um, at the advent of kind of news tying. And so we think about like quilting in really wonderful, warm ways as a communal, you know, gathering place and spot. And that's important to me. But I'm also like, who was this knowledge of this news knot, which is very actually specific to the United States, that particular tension to knot that we recognize as a news. I'm like, y'all, this is knowledge. This is like textile process based knowledge that was passed down in spaces. Those, those like, similar to quilting, what were those spaces and what was that like? You know, when were you like, hey, I'm gonna come and teach you how to uh, tie this knot or do this thing. So a lot of it for me, I guess, is about archiving um, in terms of the types of materials on the one side. On the other side, I mean, again, with this masquerade work, I don't know, like I'm really not thinking about you when I'm making it. I'm not, like I'm not thinking about the viewer, I'm not thinking about a buyer, I'm, I'm really just listening to what I'm being told to do and I am doing it. And so um, that is an interesting and very different place to be as a maker, you know, or even as a conduit where it's just like, okay, we're gonna make this thing and you know, then it's gonna be out there. Um, but then for some of the kind of hats and adornments, it is less about the viewer and actually more about the wearer. And so for those, I really resonate with the terminology that Vanessa has originated with this, this idea of the power figure. Um, as a queer, non-binary, poor, black, disabled, chronically ill person, um, it's possible to be invisible in a lot of spaces and that invisibility or that refusing to see kind of leads to lack of access to things, you know, and so people will question, uh, one of the questions that I hate that people bring up about poor black people is like, why did you spend all that money on those shoes? Because if I wear expensive shoes, people will let me sit in this fucking train station where I can plug in my phone and have air conditioning and access to a bathroom. You know, like a train station is built for loitering and I can loiter here if I look like I have some resources. And so when I think about making head adornments, one of the things that I found is like wearing a hat and particularly wearing an extravagant hat 
reorients the world around the wearer. Like there are several things that happen that are really important and valuable to people in my circles. One of them is people back the fuck up. So like people respect your space in a totally different way. Um, Whereas, you know, otherwise people may be bumping into you because they're not seeing you or touching you because they're objectifying you in a strange way. Now there's kind of this theater created around you where you just have space and you move, but also you become really visible. And I think about um, ACT UP and the work that was done around AIDS advocacy uh, and the way that one of their tactics was to center, literally center the most vulnerable people and make them the most visible so that when the police were grabbing people or brutalizing people, those people who were hyper, um, super vulnerable would kind of be more safe because they were more visible. So thinking about the media, like you're going to have to watch these people do this thing to these vulnerable people. And we're watching some of that happen now in the media with uprisings that are happening. And so these adornment pieces that I'm making also create this, this situation where people who are incredibly vulnerable can then be highly visible and centered in a particular way that can mean safety, a different kind of safety, a different kind of access to um, service, to help. I mean, I'm trying to tell you like the difference when I drop off a piece, I have a patron who um, is wealthy who lives in Northern Virginia and has this amazing building that apparently black people don't enter through the front door of very often. And the difference between when I'm wearing one of my pieces, when I drop off her work and when I'm not wearing one of my pieces, even if I'm wearing the same clothes is just wild, you know? And so for me, that's really important in terms of where I want my work to live. I'm not sure yet. And I haven't had to contend with that question uh, yet. In different ways in terms of the adornment they live in people's homes and on their heads and so that's super easy in terms of the masquerades i feel really protective of them um and i don't even necessarily share them with people on studio visits or things like that i'm like i don't know like you know, it's kind of like let me find out if i'm going to talk with you about this or not in terms of the larger installations like the new Snick cross or this piece i think of those as being housed in institutions mostly because of their size and also uh, part of what you um, talked about was the delicacy you know working in fiber is something that degrades quickly and in terms of like storing and preserving you're thinking about light and moisture and um, different things and i think institutions have the kinds of um, resources to be able to maintain that. But also, I mean, there's people like Peggy Cooper Crafitz, you know, so she was an institution. Ashe. T, Ashe, Peggy. Um, I'll answer, uh, so where do I want the work to live? I want the work to live everywhere. The work <laughs> yes. There's a period of time where I take the work outside and it's just in front of my house. There's oh, I love it. Where I will take a small sculpture and I'll write the best to have different kinds of artist talks. Um, but it, the where I am right now in my career, I end up dealing with collectors and I end up dealing with institutions. I end up dealing with museums or academic institutions or, oh, you know what has started to recently happen to me? Very, very wealthy collectors who are starting a museum. Those oh. people are very interesting to me. Um, so I have, so what, what I will say is I want the work to live everywhere. I want the work to be seen. And I want people to have a living experience with the work. So if it's a white person who is going to take home one of my power figures, they're going to need to be prepared to dream differently. They're going to need, <laughs> they're going to be prepared to um, pass by that work of art in a different way uh, every day because the work is alive. The work is dimensionally alive and um, they're not going to be able to experience it without um, coming into the arc of the electricity of the work. That's on them. See what happens. Um, but my job is for the work to come through and for me to not be an obstacle to the work coming through. What has happened to me recently though is I of collectors who will have to, um, they, they don't fight, but they have to, you know, somebody says, I saw the work first. Somebody says, I got more money for the work. Mm. And had collectors more recently lobby me. What? For, 
they will write me personally and they will say it's um you, I, we really want this work. We saw it first, but now this institution wants it. And here, let me tell you, I, I really had a collector say, listen, your work could go there. That's great. You could raise your prices if your work goes there, but I want you to know how many black children will see your work in this space and how, what it means community for it to be in this space. So that is an interesting that started to happen recently where collectors mm -hmm. Um, some, the thing is, the person who says, doesn't your gallery do that? My gallery does do that. But with social media, people find you. It doesn't matter. They find you. They reach out to you. They try to circumvent your galleries. They try to circumvent um, anybody who is in between you. Um, I find that collectors really, really want to have, there are some collectors who really, really want to get to know artists. They want to be close to artists. They want you to have dinner at their house. They want you to meet their friends. They want their friends to collect your work. It becomes, I remember reading an article years ago that Kara Walker talked about dealing with collectors. And I was like, is that real? That sounds like sitcom art world. <laughs> <laughs> so, Zoe. <laughs> so, um, I want the work to be everywhere that it matters. And I trust that the work won't go where it won't matter. Mm, well, well, that's that. All right. Um, we have quite a few questions that are sort of more specific to some of you. I'm going to try to get through the ones that are not. Um, Bukola Koiki, I'm sorry if I've mispronounced your name, has asked, what was your first memory of making? Ooh. My mother was a fiber artist. She made us make our own clothes. If we wanted the new hottest thing, she'd be like, get that pattern. You want some guest jeans? Go on, cut out a little triangle. Uh, <laughs> you're going to have to make it yourself. So my mother taught us to read the backs of patterns. She taught us to look through her sewing room for the type of material that was right for the clothing that we wanted. We would look up, we would go through all the notions, all the buttons, all the zippers, all the snaps. So my first memories of making were with my mother. My first memories of making were watching my mother carve out deliberate space for herself to create and then protect that space, which is like, you can't use my sewing scissors. Don't come in here when I do this. And that gave me permission. Um, but also we grew up with, my mother had five kids, so we didn't have a whole lot of money for everything we made. We made anything we could make. We made toys, we made hair stuff and we made our own clothes. So what's really important to me about my first memories of making are that I learned that it's not a joke. It's not arts and craft after school. It's not just something that is a hobby or it's flimsy. I learned as a very young child that you make, you create the substance of your life. And then I learned a more important lesson, which is that something is happening to you when you're making. Something is happening to you when you are in that process and you can lean in to that world, that mysterious thing that happens, that thing that is happening to you physically, spiritually, psychologically, when you're making. I learned as a child not to mess with that. So learning two things, the making, but also the becoming of the self, the becoming of whole through, the becoming wholeness through process. I love that, yeah. I mean, I think for me, um, there were, it's been multiple things. like the telling of me like my parents telling a story all the time of when you were two you were drawing people upside down like they love to tell that story so i think i've always been <laughs> making and drawing and doing something um because i couldn't help it but i think for me craft practices were really the root of the beginnings of my thinking about the world in an artistic way um, and again, through sewing, my mom was a seamstress. She sewed all my, all my dresses and, you know, Halloween costumes or whatever. Um, and her trying to teach me, but not having the patience to learn because I just, I, I don't like sewing in the traditional sense, but those moments were really, um, important to just getting my mind thinking about, uh, creativity in a, in a, in a way that I don't think a lot of people around me, I was always that kid that was I was making stuff um but one memory in particular that I think that I always look back to that was very poignant in my in really specifically thinking about sculpture was 
when I was growing up in Chicago, I would, they, my family would take me to um, the Children's Museum and they had this room that you could literally buy a, a, pla a, a bag and fill it up, just walk in the room and fill that bag up with whatever objects were in that room and you were just paying for the bag. And I will never forget that it was like being a kid in a candy store and that moment of object collection became very important. I will, again, I was, I had to have been like five, but it was just literally like, look at all of the, this, some of, a lot of it was trash, but look at all this stuff that I get to um, play with. And, you know, I think that moment, I always go back to that moment for myself in terms of sculpture. Uh, I feel like that's a really hard question to answer. I feel a lot of resonance with Vanessa's answer. Um, and I think that it's probably easier to think about when I was not making and I don't have memories of that. And so if that makes sense, you know, it's, it's, I feel like making has been so incredibly integral to my life and it's been really consistent and it's been one of the very few consistent things because I had a very um I had a childhood that was just very uh here and there just a lot of movement and a lot of change and whatever but uh the making is a portal very much for me the, just the idea that Vanessa stated which is you know that we're kind of making our own world we're making our own way of being was really 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 important to me I think as like a grounding in very traumatic space it was like cool I'm gonna make this bubble for me and that was done through making so very similarly to uh, Vanessa and Alicia it's like yeah we were making clothes we were making I mean it like I remember having wire toys, like these wire men that we used to make out of stripped electrical wire or like pipe cleaner if we got to buy materials, but stripped electrical wire if we didn't get to buy materials. I remember making a lot of things out of mud. I remember making a lot of things out of stuff that was collected around the farmyard. Uh, just being introduced to a lot of materials because my mom had all these different jobs and ways that she was moving, I think more than anything else um my mom was a really important figure for me because it was like you can literally work with whatever you want and do whatever you need to do and at the same time for me there's an interesting space that i'm in and that i'm realizing even now as i'm kind of building this space that i'm um inhabiting forever however long i am in dorchester you know this morning when i was like oh i need to build this place so that i have somewhere to put my computer you know so i'm going to build these shelves where i also need some stuff to put my um to put my studio stuff on literally this morning i was like cool i'm gonna build these shelves and while i was building the shelves i was like boo you just built these shelves like you you'd be making stuff you are making ass somebody you know and so i think i regularly have these like realizations these moments of realization where i'm like you made that like look at that look at that thing that you made um so i, I think it it just it just is so i guess the answer to the question which was what is your earliest member of making it's like i don't know i mean i just am like flooded with memories of making when i try to access the earliest one i i'm like what i don't know when did i not make stuff i don't know i don't know There goes that collapsing of time again. Um, so, uh, so I have some specific questions um, for Vanessa that I'm gonna dive into really quick that I think may end up bringing us back into things for each of you. Um, <laughs> uh, oh man, I lost it. I love the waiting movement. Okay. Um, Jocelyn Braxton Armstrong has asked a question for Vanessa. What do you make the heads, hands, feet, and other parts of, or are they all found objects? I make them. I make them all. They're, uh, if you go onto my Instagram right now and look at a post from a couple days ago, you can actually scroll through about 10 of the heads that I make. I make them out of, I am, um, and so, Thinking about time, somebody, uh, 
Yo, you know who I love? I love Allison Saar. And Allison was walking through my show in, uh, in December when we were in New York. And she said, how do you make so much stuff? Like, you work so fast. And I say, Allison, I work like I'm going to die one day. I work like this isn't going to be forever. Yeah, so that's really, really hard. And I work fast. So I have created fast process for huh. some of my work. And one of those is the heads. So the heads are not clay and they're not wood. I mix plaster with wood glue. Wow. Them. They're all individually, they're hand built. And it's, um, each one of them is a channeling. Also, each one of them is just my hands and my soul and it's the technology of my soul. It is that information. I said, how can I be in communication with my ancestors? You have no idea how many times I have made a face and been at one of my shows in Cognito. Like people don't know I'm the artist. I hear people say, that looked like Aunt Jackie. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, and I'm like, well, it would make, that makes sense to me. And I, I love when that happens, when people see themselves or they see their family members and their faces. Um, the hands and the feet, uh, sometimes I make them and sometimes they're mannequin hands. Sometimes they're those model hands. Sometimes they are not hands and feet at all. Sometimes they're spoons or sometimes they're birds. Or, um, But for me, a very important part of my process is making the heads. It is a sacred time in the studio, and I cannot be obstructive to the frequency of that process because it matters so much to my future ancestors and my ancient ancestors. So that is a sacred process for me of making those uh, those heads. Ah, oh, thanks for the question, yo. Yo, you got like four five questions oh. here. <laughs> um, I'm trying to be economical here because it is 2.41 <laughs> somehow. Uh, this is the longest 4.4 there's ever been. So shout out to y'all. Um, are you all with continue, okay with continuing for a few more mm -hmm. questions? I know I, I didn't uh, anticipate this going this long. Um, oh, Malara, hold your hands up. Hold what? your hand up, Alicia. Should I as well? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes, my liney, liney palms. <laughs> What's wrong with the lininess of them? Oh, no. This is merely an observation. There's nothing wrong with it. I hear it tell it's very good. Um, all right. So I love this. I of you, Naima, saying, I hear tell it is good. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, you know. <laughs> hi. Christine Mays has asked hi from San Francisco I loved your comment about residing in a world that often overlooks the soul how do you maintain an open channel and stay within a certain receptivity what does self-care look like for you I actually would like all of you to answer that because I think at the at the heart of all of your practice that connection um, is resonant and important um, so one of the things is I don't maintain an open channel because the channel has to be protected, right? So there are times when the channel is open and there are times when, like, I, I feel like there are um, secret places in my melanin, melanated body and in my soul where I can tuck, where I can protect that part of myself that opens to a frequency that vibrates in a way that it, I don't have language for. So I do not maintain an open channel because the world is fucking crazy. And, um, but when I do open channel in the space, I pay very close attention to the entirety of the ecosystem. I drink a lot of water in the studio. I um, actually won't eat a lot during the day. So there's a, it's a whole ritual that goes along with things. The scent of my studio is really important. Um, but what you're asking, what I hear you asking, which I think is a very important question, is how do you protect your soul? How do you maintain your soul in this world? And one, what I will say is one of the first things that I had to do was give myself permission to live with my soul as um, an active limb in my everyday life. So not like be like, okay, I'm gonna be with my soul only when I'm home in front of an altar, or when they're here or there. No, like um, from the spiritual tradition, the understandings that I have is not that your body has a soul, but that your soul has the body. So 
So I'm moving through the world as a soulful human being and interacting soulfully because I give myself, I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid of white supremacists. I'm not afraid of racism. I'm not afraid of, of black folks who have internalized white supremacy coming in at me trying to get this stuff. I'm just not afraid to uh, live through my soul. So giving permission to be with my soul, which then automatically shucks a whole bunch of bullshit out the way. When you make the decision to stand and to move forward with the breath and inhabiting the citizenship of your soul, a whole bunch of stuff falls away and you don't need to worry about it anymore. Um, recognize that protection of the soul is serious work in the world that we live in. And one of the main ways that I am able to protect my soul is by one, recognizing that um, love is powerful. So when I do what I love, when I'm in my studio, when I'm listening to music, when I'm singing and when I'm dancing, I can transcend a sort of mainstream level of being and be in communication with my own ideas in a way where there's less static. So by doing what you love, and I do, this is, I do not want this to sound trivial, but Christine, I know that something happens to you when you are in your studio and you are working with the wire when you are doing all of that work. Well, I trust that space and I trust that time as an entire ecosystem of dimensional loving and I go to that space for the work that needs to be done in my soul and in the world around me. Um, so entering into that loving space with expecting love to be more miraculous and powerful and expansive than we have language for, and then giving your energy towards love that way is removing it from the idea that there are things external from you that are going to protect your soul, that there's an external force, that there's a church, that there's a guru, that there's a thing. Those things can insist, it, it assist, but deep within your being, in the line of your being, there are... Um, there is still, there's warrior spirit within you and it's deeply connected to love. I wish I could talk to about protecting your soul and owning your soul. And so for me, then self-care is loving. Self-care is doing the things that bring me love and bring me joy. So I'm in my garden. I drink a lot of water. I'm in my studio. I don't mess with, I don't have a whole lot of people around me a lot, but the people who are, are around me, they allow me to love them openly and intimately. And they're not shy about the tenderness or the romance in which I love and I honor them and I honor the earth. So I keep people out of my life who are like, girl, that's weird. Girl, this is <laughs> yeah. around. Um, so that's one of the ways that I take care of myself. I have a carefully curated um, group of, well, my soul keeps me from giving out my energy in places where it would um, fall fallow okay that was a lot thank you christine for the question everybody else have fun answering that question <laughs> Meanwhile, i'm literally in tears over here it's fine i really resonate with that because um for me it took a long time for me to um allow myself to do this work because I was caught up in a lot of other, what other people think I should be doing, what my family think I should be doing, what they, you know, they, I should be a dentist. I should be a psych, you know, all these things that are not art related because they think that that's what society says we should be doing for money, whatever. They're um, saying they're afraid for you. They're afraid. They're afraid. That yes. Art yep. Yes. But you have shown them such bravery in your life. You have shown them that. What a gift you have given your people. Thank you. And honestly, but that's taken, it, it's such a toll. It's, it's, it's taken a toll in my life in a lot of um, ways. But at the end of the day, I've become stronger because I've been able to say, no, this is what I do. I can't help it. I can't not make this work. Um, to not make the work is death to me. And, and when you're talking about love, that's so, oh my God, it's so important because I love myself enough, or I love myself so much now at this time in my life, and that gives me the power to do the work that I'm doing because I'm not uh, listening to everyone else. What do I need? What do I want? So for my self care, it's really about this. It's about meditation. It's about so. It's about isolating myself a little bit from the world, and I know I have to have this balance, and so I'm always finding that balance. But a lot of times I'm by myself, and I love it because that's where I'm able to connect more deeply with my ancestors, with this energy that, you know, I'm trying to materialize, you know, I can't 
materialize anything when I'm, when, you know, people are in my ear or when, you know, I have to have this isolation time um, to, to channel, if you will. And also nature. I mean, it's, it's a very, it's like literally my, my remedy because when I'm able to walk out and be in the park or wherever, or just literally looking at the tiniest thing, I, I know there's more to the world. And, and it somehow that just gives me this comfort that I need. Um, but I really think it goes back to a, I can't help but do what I do. And I'm so grateful. Like if I had been born at any other time, I, I don't know what, how and who I would be because I need to do this. It's not like, I was just talking to somebody other, the other day that doesn't make any art and they were just like, oh, it's so cool that you, um, you know, allow yourself, you know, you're, you're following your dreams. I'm like, that's great. But this is not even me following my dreams. This is, I have to do this. There's no, oh, maybe I'll do, maybe I'll make something today. No, it's a part of my, my soul. And so what I'd have to do for self-care is step out of my isolation sometimes into the public sphere and actually be around people because I will not eat. I will not do other things because I'm so locked in sometimes. So it's a balance. It's a balance. Uh, for me, care is such an intentional part, intentional part of every aspect of my life. I think I have very briefly um, touched upon the idea that kind of making has been a form of escape and a form of um, creating a safe space in traumatic moments um, or extended traumatic periods. And so definitely my studio practice creates this portal into a very secure and safe space, but it's also a way of kind of communing with um, various kind of witnesses and spirit guides and ancestors and um, folks who are just around kind of helping me move through and cultivate that intention and care. Um, more recently, I have been able to be in a place of more stability um, and support which hasn't really meant very much that my material circumstances have changed, but being in a community of care has been really important um, and cultivating a community that where we're kind of interdependent and um, reciprocating care for each other has been amazing and just really increased capacity to be able to, I mean, do and be and live in ways that I hadn't thought of before. And so that's been really important to my practice and it's allowed me to be safe in my physical body in ways that I hadn't previously been, which also means that I'm able to respond to my body in ways that I hadn't previously been. So where before I might kind of work through hunger or work through hydrating or things like that, I'm now able to cultivate more body trust so that I don't do that. And um, I know that the work is going to be there and that I have enough time to kind of into myself physically. And so recently, um, care has been building more body trust and being more intentional with my body. But I mean, it sounds really cute, I guess, and easy in the way that I'm framing it. But essentially what happened was uh, last year, so I just graduated from an MFA program. And um, the program was a really, really difficult environment. Um, a very, very hostile environment to me and very aspects of my being. And what happened is my body literally just said, no, <laughs> I can just shut down. I had nervous system pain and I couldn't like, I couldn't open doors. I couldn't lift my pans, which are all cast iron, like seasoned cast iron to cook. Um, I couldn't sit in chairs for more than five minutes. I mean, it was really intense. I was like, carrying a yoga mats to class because I would have to take classes or even teach classes that I was partially teaching lying down like literally I would lie on a table and be like this is where my body is today right now in this moment um and that taught me a lot about like what my limits were and what was possible and what wasn't possible and it also taught me a lot about um what kinds of things I can no longer ignore in terms of um, stuff that exists in 
in environments or no longer subject myself to. And so care for me is really in that body trust of being like, you know, intuition or body or spirit or all three, because they're all kind of in communication and communicating with me in different ways, says no, then I say no. <laughs> Sometimes I'm like, oh, you know, but I just don't do it. Or if it says this is a thing that we need, then this is a thing that we need. Um, and so, yeah, care for me looks very much like being attentive to my body and the needs of my body and trusting it to tell me what it needs and creating space for it to tell me what it needs. It means paying attention to my intuitive understanding of my being and what I need in the world and the various um, beings who are walking with me and supporting me in that. Um, and I guess it also means cultivating space, like understanding that the ways that we cultivate physical, actual, you know, cultivate and arrange physical, actual space. Vanessa spoke about having certain things in the space just because they are um, working or resonating or whatever, you know, those are active objects is the way that I would say it, um, that are kind of actively engaging with you. And that's really important to me. So like for these six days that I've been in Dorchester, I've been nonstop kind of cultivating the space. And that's meant, you know, starting my indigo vet and getting her settled that's meant um, putting my indigo plants and my cotton plants in places where they're happy and figuring out where those places are, you know, all of these different things around, again, being intentional. Um, okay, so it's 2.55. Um, two more questions, and then I will let you all carry on with your lives. Um, <laughs> All right, this is a difficult because there's still six questions here. Um, this is a specific question to Vanessa, but I'm gonna trouble that and and kind of flip it and flip it and open it a bit. Um, Christine Mays asks again, can you speak to these beautiful blues in your work, in your life, on your body, in all things? But um, in terms of everyone's practice here, there is rich color, there is um, very specific uses of color. So if y'all wanna take some time and get into that, you may. Um, I'll start. Thanks for the question, Christine. Um, what I will uh, try to answer as, uh, so, what I will say about the color blue in my work, I use blue in my work. If you're familiar with it, I use it a lot, use it in the ritual, doing the lifting up song, um, doing uh, songs of grief and songs of transcendence, songs of reckoning and performance. A lot of blue, a certain electricity coming through the kind of blue that I use. Um, blue for water, uh, the miracle of water makes us uh, able to be here as human beings. And I think about the blues. I think about Ma Rainey talking about the birth of the blues, saying that there was a 14-year-old girl who walked up the center aisle at a church, at a, at, a, um, at a prayer meeting, and she sang out the sorrows that she was having. And Ma Rainey talked about stealing the blues from this girl. Mm -hmm. who, uh, but that the blues isn't what you sing. The blues is what you are doing through the song. And I'm thinking also, uh, dimensionally, I you think about the American flag, red, white, and blue, the, the honor, and I was like, whose honor is this? Like, what are you talking about? Um, but also what I recognize in my, um, the tradition of my consciousness, the color blue is a gift to human beings. The color blue was given to us as human beings purposefully, and there's dimension to that purpose, but the color blue is a gift to us as human beings on purpose, yes? So the color blue is a sight that you can see. A color blue is what you feel. A color blue is dipping into water. The color blue is rain falling on your skin. So um, even if you do not have sight, you experience the color blue. The color blue is a gift to human beings. That's what I understand. If I may, just real fast, not the obvious here, but um, in so many traditions, that, that color blue is direct connection to sacred space. It's direct connection to... Um, yes, moving negative energy to providing clarity and cleansing for the body, for the spirit, for the mind. So 
there's definitely something to that. And it's funny because I was not going to wear this. So it's <laughs> funny that we have gone there today. Like last week, every like almost everyone had on white. Deborah didn't have on white because she never wears oh. anything but black. Um, so <laughs> it's, it's interesting. Uh, anyone else, if you all want to talk about your use of color? You know, I was thinking about this last year um, when I was doing some writing about my work and I realized that I'm never thinking about color like outright. I'm never like, oh, I need to use purple right now. It's always something that it's almost subconscious that just I'll start to work and then the colors are just there. Like, I'm like, oh my God, everything is red. Why is everything, you know, and it's like, and then I have to re, I have to look, I have to do some backtracking and start to go into inside and be like, why, why was I drawn to that? And I mean, then that actually happens when just when I'm getting dressed, you know, like I will have this, I'll be wearing pink underwear and a pink shirt. And I'm like, why did I do this today? You know, but that happens in the work. And I, and I kind of been allowing myself to enjoy that sort of discovery. And um, last year I was using a lot of blue as well. And so for me, it became this um, life giving color. And it was thinking about oceans and, and thinking again about colonialism and thinking about how we got here today and that how the importance of that color in that way. But, um, but yeah, but I really, personally, I just, I, I was sort of fascinated with, with my process and I was like, wow, I don't even, why am I, I, I never, I never start a work that way, but it always ends up becoming a very specific color palette. Um, and I think it's all uh, for me tied to emotions. It's, it's really what it is about. I, I don't know. Someone raised this question uh, on a studio visit earlier this year and they were talking about kind of the, that my tendency towards raffia, this like brown color type material, like undyed natural material, it, which is something that I use over and over again and that particular person um sherry dr sherry parks that micah was like uh, it's the absence like you're almost working with the absence of color um i found that one of the things that does happen is that i uh sometimes i would be trying to make something in a color because i really like the color and i'm like yes i brought this material because i love this color red and i just cannot work in that color so red specifically is a color that I have not been able to make things in. I can make a thing that I've already made in another color. I can remake it in red, but in terms of it as a, a material moving in my hand, because also my process is very um, intuitive in terms of like the material in my hand wanting to be something. I don't know, red things just don't want to be things. When I pick them up, you know, they're really pretty and I'm really drawn to them, but they, they're like, oh, I don't, I don't. And so, I don't know, there's, an, there's some sort of intuitive um, understanding, I guess, where color is important to my process um, or the absence of it sometimes is important to my process. And I really do not know, and I couldn't tell you what that is, but I'll pick up a thing and it'll be like, this is what I wanna be. And I'm like, okay, you can be that. But um, red, magenta, they, they want to be in my space but they don't necessarily want to be anything. And so I don't, I guess that's my discussion of color. I will say for indigo, my connection to indigo um, has to do with my connection to uh, Yoruba ancestry. So I've been doing a lot of work to look into the crafts and practices that are indigenous um, to Yoruba land. Um, my dad is Yoruba and speaks Yoruba and makes, you know, like it's culturally, ethnically, um, that and came here from Nigeria. And so Adire, which is a um, really important textile tradition, uh, spiritually and culturally, um, and also in terms of gender for Yoruba folks, um, has become increasingly important to me. And so I've been cultivating a knowledge and a relationship with indigo vats and indigo the dye and indigo plants um, as a way to commune with my ancestry in that space. Um, but also I think that it's interesting that indigo then becomes a connection to, to my upbringing in the U.S. South because it was a major and important cash crop 
uh, that was grown here with the knowledge of people from West Africa. And so you'll see blue, which is actually, I know y'all are all like blue, like we just had an entire like ode to blue that happened um, here. And interesting blue, interestingly blue is actually one of my least favorite colors. Um, I don't wear it very often. I don't have it in my space very much, but it is very spiritually and culturally important to me. I'm muted. Um, <laughs> real quick. Uh, so this brings me to a place. Um, I am still going to ask that last question, but I feel like I should say something about this blue. Um, something additionally. Um, so last year I did a project. Actually, this was like more than just last year. So like two years ago, I had a project called Refraction New Photography of Africanist Diaspora. So it was like 13 um, photographers from across the globe. Um, one of the artists that was in the show uh, was Ivan Ford. And so one of the things that I really wanted to do was create like a document of that show because I feel like particularly in the context of like gallery show, there's often not a document. There is not something that is extant that connects the concepts that are being uh, delved into. So I reached out to another friend, Roger Bonner Agard, a poet based in Chicago now, and that ended up like turning into this whole other thing where we were looking at this idea of the abyss, which I was looking, going back through questions. Um, Nina Q. Allen has a question about mermaids that I'm sorry, but we're not gonna have time to get into, but also this idea of the abyss. So I, I wrote something because we ended up doing like an installation at the MCA Chicago um, last year in their like community space. Um, and what we were looking at was very much rooted in like a Caribbean-ness, so to speak. Um, so I'll just kind of read that real, real quick, real quick, real quick. We envisioned this abyss as a dimensional structure informed by Edward Glissant's formation of the abyss, Christina Sharp's concept of the hold, and the architect architectural principle of tensegrity defined as a structure containing load-bearing elements simultaneously in tension with and balanced by elements that brace. Our abyss is a medical, metaphysical primordial source, an assertion of the multifarious dimensions of Black life and potentiality through the lens of a Black Caribbean ontological framework. It is blackness, infinitely modular, flexible, collapsible, and stabilizing. As I said that, I don't know if you can hear this uh, thunder rolled just now. Um, so interesting. And so the last question. Um, this was originally posed to Vanessa as well, but I think this is a useful question for all of us to answer. Um, what advice would you give young artists that are not tapped into their personal power? Um, that question is from Melissa Hunter Davis. Shout out to you, Melissa. I'll go first. <laughs> so there comes to be a place where there's great truth in the phrase that if you ask you, if you ask, you will receive. So if an artist is aware of the fact that they are not tapped into their personal power and they would like to be tapped into their personal power, the first thing that I would do is ask, say, I would like to be tapped into my personal power and then prepare yourself. Do not create an obstacle. Um, if you say, I want to be tapped into my personal power and then you're like, but I don't really believe in power and people are crazy and this, all this, you can't immediately start to form obstacles. Um, if you open the door, you do not have to stay standing at the door. You can open the door. So acknowledge that you want to inhabit more of the power that is true for you. And inside of, um, if you would, if there, if you would like activities um, to step into more of your personal power and to listen and to hear your power, spend some time alone. It's your get away from the static that will come into your frequency. So turn the TV off, turn like get technology away from you because it's moving a lot of information um, and find places of quiet and places of stillness. If you don't have a relationship with meditation, um, go for purposeful walks, begin the walk with the question. 
if you need to begin the walk with a quote, begin the walk, um, when I say purposeful, begin the walk with a purpose uh, um, and start to really believe in the power of dimensional listening. Like I said, when you open the door, you don't have to stand at the door and watch the door. Um, open the door. So there is places also what I will say is um, slow down. Allow yourself to get slow. Allow yourself stillness for any period of time. Um, and then pay attention to the things that make you feel good. Pay attention to the things that bring you joy. So if you are drawn to a certain um, material. So it's like Alicia talked about collecting. Oh, we'll start talked about seeing the corn cobs. Pay very close attention to the objects, to the materials, to the textures, to the sounds, to the ingredients of the universe around you that are resonating with you. Um, and so for in this, for anybody who's listening to this, who is, um, is increasing their personal power, one of the things that I will say is that um, allow your, uh, there's confirmation inside of your own soul. You do not have to seek external confirmation to the abundance of power that is inside of you already. Um, so there might be a period of time where nobody else can tell you that you are stepping into your own power. You will have to trust your heart and you will have to trust your soul. And, and, and if that's difficult for you, allow yourself to do it a little bit more every single day day. Um, but there is a process of listening that is dimensional. It's listening of the body, listening of the soul, listening of the spirit, and you can invite deeper listening into your being. Um, and there's also some things that I cannot tell you about stepping into your own personal power because you know that there are things that you have been resisting as a way to in, um, inhabit more of the power that is already there, that is already yours. And that's the thing that I should say. The power is already there. It is already yours. It belongs to you. You have nurtured it. Your ancestors have nurtured it. It is being nurtured in the simultaneity of time. What you're doing is resisting. So pay attention to your resistance. And um, you might have to grieve some things that you let go, but tears are uh, healing and they're very good for you. So inside of that process, recognize where there's resistance. Open the door. You do not have to stand at the door once it's open. No, I love that. Um, I think everything that you're saying, it's about being present. It's about not um, jumping to, because for me, it's like, you know, we get into these, these moments where I don't feel powerful because I'm looking to the future so far ahead that I'm, I'm in fear. And it's about really finding the presence right here, right now, and really being able to say like, oh my God, I'm so grateful for this stool that I'm sitting on. I'm so grateful for this computer that I'm using. I'm so like starting there at that, at that level and then letting yourself understand um your place right here right now but for me personally i think finding personal power is a journey and it's ongoing and it's something that um you know i started my own spiritual journey maybe uh in 2008 from some ghostly experiences that had happened to me and then that, that led to me listening to some people on youtube who i was more who i was connected with who do astrology or tarot or whatever and and then maybe letting some of those people go and then holding on to some of them and it's just been this ebb and flow of a journey of me um learning what i need who i am and who i resonate with at that time and i think a lot of that is taking some time for you and to, to meditate and meditation. I tell a lot of people to meditate, but it's, it's like a foreign concept. And I think you have, you can't just jump right in. Sometimes you have to start on, you have to go level by level, you know, moment by moment and, um, and do that for whatever resonates with you because I can do something and it may not work for someone else, but it's about, wanting to explore that and giving yourself permission to because I, I know in times in my life I've been surrounded by people who I wasn't able to do that because they thought it was weird or you know didn't give me the space to because they were you know they maybe they felt threatened by me finding myself um but those types of people you can't surround yourself with those people if you want to you know really be in your own power so it's about shedding some of that past and 
um, appreciating the present, I think, is some ways to find the power. I'm a young artist, <laughs> so I'm like, take notes, take notes, take notes. Um, and I really appreciate the, the opportunity to be here. So thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to be here with these other amazing and wonderful people. Um, and I, I spend a lot of time in community with other people who are artists but are afraid. Um, because they're like, I don't have enough work made or my stuff isn't this stuff or whatever. And I definitely have more access to the art world and have uh, than folks. And what I typically um, say is like, and do it anyway. Like, you're not afraid. You don't have enough stuff. You haven't written a statement, you know, whatever. Like, you do it anyway. And maybe some of the things that you, you know, do in terms of like if applications are the thing then like maybe those first couple of applications you know they're not done you know that they're not done there's some part that you didn't submit but you submitted that application and the next one will be slightly more done you know that's the process that i took for myself was just being like i'm just gonna do it i'm not gonna allow myself to as uh, vanessa said to create obstacles i'm just gonna do it you know and i'm gonna get in the practice or the habit of doing the thing because the making is already happening and for most folks the making is already happening it's just the sharing or the applying or the showing typically that i find with people is the boundary and so a lot around doing that and the other thing that has been really important for me um two things one has been archives um spending time with the archives i think it's really easy to see where people are and to not um, look at where they've been and the way that we create narratives around people and about people in the art world is just so interesting. I mean, it's literally magical Negro narratives left and right. People are like, and then this person magically showed up fully formed as a Guggenheim winner or like, and then this person showed up as a whatever. And folks aren't like, you know, before that, that person was working for 40 years, 50 years in obscurity. Or before that, that person was a dancer. Or before that, that person picked up a camera at the age of 30. So I find a lot of um, support in spending time looking at the histories and the stories as much as I can access them of artists who feel close to me in some way or in my lineage. And so that's a lot of Black women artists. That's a lot of queer artists. That's a lot of Black queer artists. It's fiber artists. Um, it's artists, artists who are working from a folk tradition, but it's not just looking at their work, but it's also digging deep into like, what are their stories and what did their early work look like? Because sometimes I go back and I'm like, that's what you were doing when you, know, like when you were whatever, because there's this whole, we just see the, and this is where you are now. You have a cohesive voice and you have a portfolio and you have whatever. Um, but looking back at those early works uh, really helps me to be able to see myself and my own process represented and to say and to kind of be affirming like i'm not supposed to be this now i'm not supposed to be here at this point in my career and my making and my understanding and my process and continuity now i'm figuring it out and everybody went through that process of figuring it out and you know having a half formed something or you know, one time I didn't have pictures of my work, so I just showed up with a giant duffel bag of installations and was like, now nah, I'm gonna show, you know, everybody has been through those spaces. So the archives, the doing it anyway, and the third thing is if you do have access or can find real live people who are older, and that either means older in the work or older in the world or worlds, whichever ways, um, which may not have to do with people's actual age, but if you can find folks who are willing to walk with you, that's really important. And so for me, um, I have some women who are really important to me, like Zoe Charlton was here earlier, um, Holly Bass is another one who's really important and close to me, and they're both Black Southern women who are working um, in particular ways and with particular histories and materialities. and being present to have deep conversations with them about aspects of the process that I hadn't even thought about or didn't know were things has been really, really important and helpful. Um, and being able to run to them and be like, hey, you know, like these people ask me who I want to do a studio visit with and I want to write Frida Kahlo and I know that Frida Kahlo is dead, but I really want to talk to her. Can I do that on an application? And then being like, mm, maybe not. You know, like those types of things are really important. So archives, physical people, if you can access them and just doing it anyway, do it afraid, do it half done, it'll get there. 
Well, it is 320. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I don't even know what to say. Um, thank you is what else. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I've cried. I've had all kinds of moments. <laughs> I cried last week too, but I don't think people could tell. Um, so thank you. Thanks everyone for hanging in. The 34 of you who are still here. We appreciate it. Um, <laughs> join me again next week. Uh, I won't say who, but that will be announced on Monday. So be sure to tune in through my Instagram, etc., for that info. Um, thanks for the do curation. Want... Pardon? I said thanks for the curation. I just want to. Yeah, that was wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> curation is amazing. <laughs> it's what I do. <laughs> um, well, thank you. Um, but also, I want to say if you were interested in that text, when you get um, or just reply to whatever email you've gotten, because it'll come to me. Okay, if you want that text. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you again. Have a wonderful, wonderful rest of the day, everyone. I appreciate all of you. You have the whole day ahead of you, Alicia. Have a great <laughs> evening to uh, Vanessa and Omo. Lara. Oh, there's 20 new messages. How? Okay. <laughs> thank you. Oh, thank you, everybody. Oh, Bye, everyone. I, actually, I want I want the the three of you to stay if you can. Everybody else, leave. I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't know how to do that. Um, so I'll just, if you don't mind, sorry. I don't, have, <laughs> I don't have all of your numbers. They're leaving. They're Version leaving. of you ain't got to go, but you got to for Zoom. That's what you just did. I didn't know you could do that for Zoom. Because <laughs> I want to say something that I can't say publicly. <laughs>